My name is Anir Van Banerjee. I'm a tenure track uh, at NICHD. And also the coordinator of the Metals in Biology uh, Scientific Interest Group, the new, which is newly formed, uh, which is hosting today's speaker. Now, most of us learn about metals in our inorganic chemistry course, and, and by that coinage, uh, metals are absolved of any, anything to do with organic and, by extension, uh, biology. And so, at least for me, when I first learned about metals in biology much later, it seemed like two disparate worlds coming together. Uh, but turns out that metals uh, uh, perform an amazing area of functions in biology. About 30% of uh, proteins, uh, by some measure, are metallated. And we could have no better leader uh, than our speaker today uh, to uh, lend insights into the amazing world of metal biochemistry and, of course, a lot more. Uh, <clears throat> Square comes to us from Penn State, where he is a professor in the departments of chemistry and biochemistry, and also an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, Square is a native of Texas, got his undergraduate in Austin College, and he has really trained with the who's who in enzymology. His uh, serious initiation in research happened over a summer research stint in Chris Walsh's lab when Chris was still at MIT. And I guess that's what brought him back to MIT for his PhD, where he got his PhD working with Joanne Stabby on ribonucleotide reductase. Uh, uh, subsequently, Square did a short postdoctoral stint in Paris with Daniel Mansui on nitric oxide synthase, and then another postdoctoral uh, stint with another giant in enzymology, Perry Frey, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, Square's research embraces a broad range of challenging problems in enzyme, me enzyme mechanisms, and he has collaborated widely and has chosen whatever technique uh, it's best fit for the problem at hand, including structural biology, advanced spectroscopic techniques, and chemical synthesis. Uh, one of his main focus has been the radical SAM family of enzymes that really catalyze a mind-boggling area of chemical reactions, and many of these are involved in the synthesis of natural products and antibacterial, uh, an natural products with antibacterial or anti-cancer properties. Uh, Square has really received too many awards to say here. I'm just gonna mention a few. Uh, the American Chemical Society Arthur C. Scope Scholar Award, the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, and uh, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And just yesterday, it makes me very happy to uh, share with you that he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's also a very strong proponent of raising uh, the awareness and interest of science in underrepresented uh, communities and works very hard for that. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the United Square. So can, oh yeah, everybody can hear me because I can hear myself. Uh, it's a, you know, a real honor to come here to the National Institutes of Health to sort of give a report of how we're spending taxpayers' money. Uh, it, it's been a great, great day today. I, you know, I've known a, a lot of people here for, for quite some time and it's been great interacting with them and, and learning about you know, all of the wonderful science that, that takes place here, uh, much of which I, I, I was already uh, aware of. So one of the things that my lab is, is interested in is how, how you functionalize an unactivated carbon center. How do you put a functional group on a carbon center that is not easily functionalized because it doesn't have uh, pKa values that are low enough to, to do acid-base type chemistry. And so much of what we know, I have to learn how to work this laser pointer, much of what we know comes uh, from uh, enzymes that activate molecular oxygen, molecular oxygen to generate a potent oxidant. And there are a number of these types of, of strategies. Some of the more common ones are enzymes that have heme cofactors, such as cytochrome P450, there are enzymes that contain these carboxylate bridged dinuclear iron centers, such as methane monooxygenase and others. There are enzymes that contain a mononuclear iron that's bound by an alpha ketoglutarate cofactor, such as tau D. And among many others, there are enzymes that simply have 
a mononuclear iron that's bridged by a HIST-2 carboxylate motif and a water molecule, as in isopenicillin in synthase. In these cases, typically molecular oxygen uh, is a substrate, and I can sort of illustrate how these enzymes typically function broadly by the reaction mechanisms of cytochrome's P450. So these enzymes will take uh, thiolate ligated heme cofactor in the presence of molecular oxygen, a couple of electrons and a couple of protons. They'll split molecular oxygen to generate water and this very high energy intermediate called compound one. This is an iron four oxo species that has this pi cation radical uh, on the uh, porphyrin chain. This has the oxidizing power to simply rip off a hydrogen atom, that's H dot, from the substrate to create what's called compound two, shown here, and this substrate radical. And then this can simply rebound a hydroxyl group onto that substrate radical to generate your functionalized organic molecule, shown right here, all right? So this is one of the ways in which you can functionalize an unactivated carbon center with oxygen. But if you look in nature, there are a number of biomolecules that have, instead of oxygen, they have sulfur that has been attached to an unactivated carbon. So here is biotin, for example, that's derived directly from this substrate, dethiobiotin, wherein a sulfur has to be inserted between that carbon and that carbon. Here, for example, is lipoic acid, wherein sulfurs are inserted at carbons six and carbon eight to generate the final product. There are also these molecules, macromolecules, that contain methyl thio groups, shown right here. And so this protein uh, uh, is protein S12 of the bacterial ribosome, where a sulfur is attached to an aspartyl residue, and this sulfur has a methyl group uh, on it as well. And then there are a variety of tRNA molecules that have sulfur methyl thio, sulfur methyl, attached to C2 of adenosine 37. And these are uh, hypermodified tRNAs, so there's typically some other type of group at this particular position. So although sulfur resides just under oxygen in the periodic table, the same strategies that are available to oxygen for functionalizing unactivated carbon centers are not available to, the, to sulfur. And so one of the questions that we wanted to ask many years ago when we started on this particular project is, how is it that you functionalize an unactivated carbon center with sulfur? And although we work on all of these projects that I showed you, our main model system has been the biosynthesis of this molecule right here called lipoic acid, okay? So lipoic acid is a key cofactor in a number of different multi-enzyme complexes that are involved in energy metabolism as well as in the breakdown of uh, certain amino acids. And these include the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which I'm sure everyone's uh, uh, aware of, the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, the branch-chain alpha-ketoacid dehydrogenase complex, the glycine cleavage system, and in bacteria, there's this enzyme called acetoin dehydrogenase. Now, there's very little free lipoic acid in the cell. It's almost always tethered to a specific lysyl residue that is located on uh, one of the subunits of, of these complexes. And we typically call these subunits lipoyl carrier proteins. They are attached to this specific lysyl residue in an amet linkage, and that generates this long 14 angstrom sort of sw swinging arm that allows the carrier protein to mediate the transfer of intermediates from one particular subunit in the complex to uh, other subunits of the particular complex. 
And although we've known for quite some time how lipoic acid functions in these complexes, it's only relatively recently that we've begun to understand how this molecule is biosynthesized, even though it's rare, fairly simple in its structure. Some of our first hints came from pioneering studies by John Cronin's laboratory at the University of Illinois. And what John taught us is that in E. coli, there are two pathways for building the lipoid cofactor. There is a pathway that he calls the exogenous pathway. And in the exogenous pathway, free lipoic acid can be taken up. It can be activated by an, uh, a bifunctional enzyme called LPLA, which activates the carboxylate group via ATP to give this AMP intermediate shown right here. And then its second activity is to transfer the lipoyl moiety from lipoyl AMP to a lipoyl carrier protein shown right here. And that gives you your lipoyl cofactor. So that's lipoic acid bound to the lipoyl carrier protein in its amide linkage. John Cronin also taught us that there is a second pathway by which organisms can synthesize their own lipoic acid de novo. This pathway is an offshoot of fatty acid biosynthesis, which takes place on a small uh, a protein called the acyl carrier protein. As you know, in fatty acid biosynthesis, you build up fatty acids two carbons at a time. And so when you get a, to a species that has eight carbons, that becomes a substrate for this protein called octanoyl transferase. And that protein will transfer the eight carbon chain to your lipoyl carrier protein to give you this species shown right here. And in the very last step of the pathway, this protein called lipoyl synthase, we abbreviate LIPA, will catalyze the attachment of sulfur here and sulfur there to give you your intact lipoyl cofactor on your lipoyl carrier protein, okay? So what we know about the biosynthesis of lipoic acid before we actually entered uh, into this, this area came primarily from in vivo feeding studies by uh, Ronald Perry, who was at Rice University uh, after leaving uh, Virginia Tech. And what he taught us is that octanoic acid in and of itself, free octanoic acid can serve as a precursor to lipoic acid in vivo. So if he fed E. coli octanoic acid, it was converted into lipoic acid without any type of degradation. He also showed that transformation involves the removal of only two hydrogens. So to make lipoic acid, you only need to remove hydrogens at C6 and hydrogens at C8. And so that means that there are probably no uh, desaturated intermediates that would include double bonds adjacent to these particular carbons. So there are no removal of hydrogens from C5 and C7. And I'm sure all the enzymologists will appreciate here that carbon six is prochiral. An enzyme can distinguish these two hydrogens in its active site. And hysteriochemical studies showed that it's the pro-R hydrogen that's removed, shown right here, but that the sulfur goes in with inversion of configuration, all right? And so based on that information, Bob White, who was at Virginia Tech, or he may have been Rice at the time, suggested that perhaps you make lipoic acid in this fashion. The first thing you do is use one of those P450 type mechanisms that I showed you on the first slide to make oxygenated intermediates. So six hydroxy octanoic acid, eight hydroxy octanoic acid, and six eight hydroxy octanoic acid. And then he suggested that you might then activate those hydroxyl groups and then displace the activated hydroxyl group with some sort of sulfur nucleophile. And the great thing about that proposal is that these P450 type reactions are known typically to proceed by retention of configuration. 
So the great thing is that the SN2 displacement by a sulfur nucleophile would give you this inversion of configuration that you're expecting at carbon six. And so he synthesized a number of possible intermediates and he fed all of these to E. coli and he found that none of them were converted to lipoic acid, suggesting that this pathway is not viable. By contrast, he showed that 8-thiooctanoic acid was poorly uh, transferred, uh, converted into lipoic acid, and 6-mercaptooctanoic acid was converted into lipoic acid probably even 10 times more poorly. So although these were potential intermediates, they were not great intermediates uh, in this pathway. And so when we began to work on this project, there were two main questions that we wanted to address. The first question, of course, is, well, how are we gonna cleave these carbon-hydrogen bonds? The pKa values aren't sufficiently low for us to remove protons and do acid-base chemistry. And then the $64,000 question is, well, where are the sulfurs coming from? And so those are the two main questions that I wanna address uh, today. So it was Michael Marletta, actually, and his coworkers that first characterized uh, this enzyme, and he showed that lipoosynthase belonged at that time to an emerging superfamily of enzymes called radical S-adenosylmethionine, all right? So most of us appreciate S-adenosylmethionine as a methyl donor, right? Anytime you need to add a methyl group to something, most of the time it's gonna come from S-adenosylmethionine. But in this superfamily of enzymes, S-adenosylmethionine binds in contact with the 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster that all of these enzymes absolutely have, and this was shown by Joan Broderick and, and Brian Hoffman, this binding motif. And when that iron sulfur cluster is in a reduced state, it catalyzes the cleavage of this 5 prime carbon sulfur bond to give you methionine, which is basically a spectator in the reaction, but also this 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical. And for those of you who are familiar with cobalamin chemistry, and remember adenosyl cobalamin, it's the same radical that's generated in adenosyl cobalamin dependent enzymes. And so we know that this 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical is potent enough as an oxidant to rip off hydrogen atoms even from unactivated carbon centers. So that answers the question of most likely how are we removing the hydrogen atoms? But again, the big question is where are the sulfur atoms coming from? All right, it turns out that at Penn State, I have this awesome collaborator. I have a lot of awesome collaborators and colleagues at Penn State. But one of these guys is a Mossbauer uh, uh, spect spectroscopist. And Mossbauer spectroscopy can tell you almost anything you need to know about iron. And it even allows you to quantify all the different types of species of iron in a sample. And so working with Karsten, we showed that at that time, unlike almost all other radical SAM enzymes, lipoyl synthase contained not just one 4-iron-4 four sulfur cluster, but it contained a second iron sulfur cluster shown right here. And this is this cluster that is, uh, is ligated by cysteines in a cis-X4, cis-X5 cis motif. This cysteine motif right here is found almost universally in radical SAM enzymes. This motif right here is found almost only in lipoyl synthases, okay? So we determined that these enzymes have two 4 iron 4 sulfur clusters. This cluster you need to generate your radical. This cluster we had no idea what its function would be in this reaction. Around 2004, Kathy Drennan had just solved the structure of biotin synthase in collaboration with Joe Jarrett. And we were at the White House. We were getting these PCASE awards. And Kathy said, you know, I'd really like to try to do the structure of lipoyl synthase. And we were, of course, excited to be able to work with somebody of, of her caliber. 
But let me tell you, it wasn't easy, <laughs> you know. So after about 10 years, turns out that the secret to getting the structure was getting the right high school student. And so this guy right here, Martin McLaughlin, was a high school student that came to, to work for me. This dude was just super excited about science, let me tell you that. And uh, Martin was able to screen proteins, of course, anaerobically in the glove box, because all of these proteins hate oxygen, to come up with conditions under which lipoyl synthase from mycobacterium tuberculosis would crystallize. And once he got those crystals, he worked in collaboration with my graduate student at the time, Nicholas Lons, shown right here. Once he got those crystals, it was time for him to go off to college. And he said, you know, Squire, I just got accepted to MIT. And guess what? Kathy said I could work in her lab. Can I take these crystals with me? And I said, Martin, sure. I mean, in fact, Kathy and I have a, a collaboration. And so as an undergraduate at MIT, he solved the crystal structure of, of lipoyl synthase. And so, you know, quickly I'll just go over uh, uh, the, the different domains in the structure. The, the, the structure consists mainly of three different uh, domains. In green right here is the alpha-6, beta-6 partial TEM barrel. That domain houses the iron sulfur cluster that binds to s methionine. That's shown down here. And so that domain is responsible for generating the radical. This domain right here in teal contains the cysteines that bind to that second iron sulfur cluster, which we call the auxiliary cluster. And then this last domain is sort of this alpha helix right here that kind of folds over the active site to sort of protect it. Now, if you look closely at the domain that contains the cysteines that bind to the iron sulfur cluster, there was a, a particular surprise. The auxiliary cluster is bound by three cysteines and one serine ligand, SER-292. Serines are not predicted to be good ligands because they're predicted to contain their protons when they're ligated to the oxygen, unlike cysteines that act as thiolates. So we think that this cluster is set up not to be stable, okay, based on what we saw. Now we predicted then that, well, we don't know where the sulfurs are coming from in this reaction, but let's just run a reaction and see what happens, right? And so on this particular slide, anytime you see, or, and, and later in the talk, anytime you see a dashed line right here, that represents the concentration of enzyme that we have in our assay, so you can see, all right? So if we run a lipoyl synthase assay, this is what happens. In red, you see relatively rapid, and I say relatively because this ain't carbonic anhydrase, let me tell you that. Relatively rapid formation of 6 thiooctanoal acid, shown right here, and then slow decay, and then you see formation of lipoic acid, shown right there. The interesting thing is that the amount of product that we get back basically equals the amount of enzyme that we have in our assay. And there's no other sulfur source that we add in these particular assays. So this suggested to us that the enzyme itself was contributing the sulfurs uh, uh, to the product. And we can address this in this experiment. If we take lipoic acid that we produced in media that contains natural abundant sulfur, this is just a control, natural abundant sulfide as the only source of sulfur, then we isolate the protein, of course the lipoic acid that we get back is going to be at natural abundance, which is largely S32. By contrast, if we do the same experiment, but now we overproduce lip A in E. coli cultured in media containing S34 labeled sulfide as our only source of sulfur, and uh, when we isolate that protein and then assay for uh, lipoic acid, I think my laser pointer might be dead, assay for lipoic acid, all our lipoic acid is S34 label, as shown right there, all right? 
So that tells us that for sure the, the sulfurs are coming from the protein. Now if we mix these two species together in approximately equal amounts, we can ask the question, do both sulfurs come from the same polypeptide? Or do you insert one sulfur using one polypeptide, one enzyme, and then you go and bind another polypeptide to insert the other sulfur? And that's an easy experiment to do. If they both came from the same polypeptide, then you would get a distribution of just S32 labeled lipoic acid and S34 labeled lipoic acid. By contrast, if they came from different polypeptides, you would see a one to two to one distribution of S32 labeled, S32, S34, and fully S34 labeled. And so we can do the experiment. Here's the experiment with lipoic acid, uh, isolated from E. coli cultured with natural abundant sulfur. Here's lipoic acid isolated from E. coli cultured in S32 labeled sulfide. And when we mix them together in approximately equal amounts, what you see is by and large, the peak at 220, uh, corresponding to natural abundance and the peak at 224 corresponding to the uh, S34 label species. So that's, I don't think this is gonna work. He tells me it doesn't work on the screen. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, S34, so that tells us that both sulfurs come from the same polypeptide. And so with this information, we can start to piece together a mechanism for how this reaction might take place. So we're gonna start out over here. This is the iron sulfur cluster that binds to S methionine. In its reduced state, it's gonna cause the fragmentation of this particular bond to give us methionine and this 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical. This 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical is directed to stereoselectively abstract the 6-pro-R hydrogen of the substrate shown right here, that gives you one equivalent of 5 prime deoxyadenosine, which we can measure by GCMS, and this substrate radical shown right here, okay? Now let me pause for just a second. When you're dealing with iron sulfur clusters, for example, this is an iron sulfur cluster in a diamagnetic plus two oxidation state. What that means is that two of the ions are at the oxidation state of ferric, Fe3, and two of the irons are at the oxidation state of ferrous, Fe2, all right? All of the sulfurs are at the oxidation of minus two, all right? So this radical right here, if it attacks this sulfide ion in this cluster, the sulfur already has eight electrons around it, right? So if that attacks that sulfide, that sulfur has to give up one of its electrons to one of the irons via interspheric electron transfer, okay? And so I've color-coded these. The red corresponds to ferric iron, and the green corresponds to ferrous. So that attacks that. Interspheric electron, that guy turns green, okay? And so in the process, you have a, a, a highly reduced cluster that's unstable, and this iron that's bound to this weak ligand, this serine, simply falls out of the system, okay? And that gives you a species that looks like a three iron, four sulfur cluster to which your organic substrate is attached, okay? So that's the first phase of the reaction by Lipowil synthase. This is one of the more simple mechanistic problems we work on because the second phase is, is a recapitulation of the first phase almost exactly. In this particular case, you'll take a second equivalent of S methionine generate your second equivalent of 5 prime deoxyadenosyl radical. That is targeted to abstract the C8 hydrogen atom right here. A second equivalent of 5 prime deoxyadenosine. This radical here can then attack that sulfur or that sulfur. We don't know which one is attacked, all right? Again, you need an interspheric electron transfer because the sulfur already has eight electrons around it. So that turns another one of these irons from ferric to ferrous, as I've shown in green right here. That produces an unstable state of the cluster right here. The lipoic acid can fall off along with that iron. That gives you the product that we're looking for. 
and we postulate that there is a two iron, two sulfur cluster remaining on the inside, okay? Now, we've tested this model. We can label carbon-6 and carbon-8 with deuterium, and we can see deuterium transfer into 5 prime deoxyadenosine, so that's consistent with our mechanism. In addition, we can quantify the amount of, of 5 prime deoxyadenosine that we get back versus lipoic acid, and we see a ratio of 2 to 1. So that's all consistent with this mechanism uh, that I have shown you. But in enzymology, in order to really provide strong evidence for any type of mechanism, you're always looking for intermediates, some sort of stable state along the reaction coordinate that you can sort of isolate and characterize. That's what enzymology is about, you know, finding intermediates that you can characterize uh, and then show experimentally that they are truly species that are involved in the reaction. And so the key intermediate in this reaction, of course, is this cross-linked species shown right here. And I just want to remind you that our substrate, this octanoyl group, is connected to a protein. This is the H protein of the glycine cleavage system. It is one of the lipoyl carrier proteins. Of course, it's not drawn to size, okay? And the iron sulfur cluster here is connected to another protein, all right, that I'm not showing at all. So we have two proteins that are coming together in this particular species. And so the question is, can we provide evidence for this cross-linked species, for one protein to be tightly bound to another protein via this inorganic cross-link? And our strategy for doing this comes from the fact that when we throw in one equivalent of s methionine, or when we throw in, when we do the reaction, carbon-6 gets the sulfur significantly faster than, than making lipoic acid, all right? So the first sulfur goes in much faster than the second. So that suggested to us that if we add just one equivalent of s methionine, we can drive everything into making this particular intermediate because you don't have the second equivalent of s methionine to put sulfur in at C8 for the cluster to, to fall apart. So that's the experiment that we're gonna do. Now, it turns out that H protein and lip A um, bind tightly together. Um, um, and so they, they, they come out together on a gel filtration column. But we can separate these two proteins, and this is just a model. We don't have a co-crystal structure of these, of these two proteins. We can separate these proteins by anion exchange chromatography, okay? And so here's the experiment. Here I'm showing you where I mix lipoyl, where my students mix lipoyl synthase, octanoyl H protein, but no SAM. So you can't do chemistry without SAM. And they take the mixture and they subject it to anion exchange chromatography. This is where lip A elutes, and this right here is where uh, the H protein elutes, okay? Now, if we do the same experiment, but now we have s methionine in the mixture, which allows us to do the chemistry, here's where unreacted protein uh, um, elutes. Here's where unreacted substrate or a little bit of, of lipoyl containing product elutes. But you see this band here that has intermediate migratory properties. And this band has both lipoyl synthase and the H protein associated with it. So we formed a complex between these two proteins, all right? So now we can do this reaction on a larger scale, and we can isolate this cross-linked species in high enough yield, and then give it to Karsten and say, Karsten, you know, what does the Mossbauer tell us about the cross-linked species? And so I won't go through the details of the Mossbauer spectra. You can ask me about them afterwards if you're interested. But Karsten and, and his students can analyze this in detail. And what he tells me is that when I analyze your samples, I see basically two major species and a small amount of another species that I think is, is, 
is a degradation product of one of these other species. But importantly, the two major species are a three iron four sulfur cluster, which we had predicted, and a four iron four sulfur cluster to which something is bound. So he can tell that one of these iron ions in the four iron four sulfur cluster is bound by something based on the Mossbauer parameters. And we predicted that that something would be a SAM molecule because that would be the cluster that SAM actually binds to, all right? Okay, and so the next question is, well, is the three iron four sulfur cluster an intermediate in the reaction? And so all the enzymologists in the audience can tell you that you can't run around yelling that you have an intermediate unless you satisfy two criteria, and Bill Jinks taught us this. You have to be able to isolate the species, throw it back into a reaction, and show that it goes to product. That's called chemical competence. Not only that, you have to show that it goes to product with a rate that is as good as the overall rate of turnover, and that's called kinetic competence. And so that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna throw in one equivalent of S-adenosomethionine, and we're gonna isolate this species shown right here. Now we need to separate these two proteins fairly rapidly because during the process of anion exchange chromatography, that small amount of that cluster that I told you about, we get a little bit of degradation because the process is slow, there's oxygen that can leach through, uh, and so we get a little bit of degradation. And so in this experiment, instead of using an entire protein, we use a peptide that contains an octanoyl lysyl residue that gets modified. The peptide does not bind tightly to the protein. It binds tightly to the protein only if it's cross-linked through chemistry, okay? So we're gonna add one equivalent of S adenosylmethionine. Using this peptide, we're gonna isolate the enzyme by gel filtration, chromatography, and then we're gonna quantify both our lipoyl product as a function of, of time, all right? And so decreasing what you see is the monophyllated species, so we quantify the monophyllated species at each of these times, all right? And then increasing with time is the, the lipoyl species. And so they have rate constants on the order of 0.1 to 0.2 uh, per minute, and that's very close to the overall rate constant for, for the reaction, it's almost the same, okay? Now, at the same time, we can look at changes in the iron sulfur cluster as a function of time, and we can do that by Mossbauer. So we isolate that intermediate, so we isolate, uh, so this is just the as isolated protein before we do any chemistry at all. You see a nice quadrupole doublet that's indicative of a plain four iron four sulfur cluster. Now we're gonna add one equivalent of SAM, then we're gonna do gel filtration, we're gonna isolate the protein and we're gonna characterize that by Mossbauer, and that's what these spectra are. By Mossbauer, we see that there's a one-to-one -one ratio of a three iron four sulfur cluster and another four iron four sulfur cluster to which S adenosylmethionine is bound. Then we're gonna add back reductant and a second equivalent of SAM. And what we see is that this cluster right here completely degrades down to ferrous iron. And this cluster stays intact with the exception that S adenosylmethionine is no longer bound, okay? And we can tell that all by the Mossbauer, all right? So we start off with two four iron four sulfur cluster. After one equivalent of SAM, we get a three iron four sulfur cluster and a four iron four sulfur cluster. And then after adding a second equivalent, this cluster completely degrades. It gets destroyed, all right? But the cluster in the radical SAM site uh, stays intact. At the same time, we look at changes in our organic substrate. So in the as-isolated enzyme, the peptide substrate and the enzyme don't co-elute by gel filtration chromatography, all right? If we add one equivalent of SAM followed by gel filtration, we get the three iron four sulfur cluster and the peptide containing a six thiooctanoyl group co-elutes with the enzyme. It co-elutes because it's connected covalently through the iron sulfur cluster. 
And then when we add our second equivalent of SAM, our auxiliary cluster is degraded to ferrous iron, and now our peptide contains a lipoyl group, okay? So this was, was all great, and we were super excited about it, and all the spectroscopists sort of, you know, liked it. You know, that was great. But for most people, a picture is worth more than a thousand words, right? And so the question is, you know, can we get a structure of what this intermediate looks like? And so I called up my high school student. I said, Martin, you know, if we give you this protein, do you think you can get, if we give you this intermediate, so Nick was making these intermediates, if we give you this intermediate, do you think you can crystallize it and show us what it looks like? And he was always very positive, and he said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And so Martin saw that structure, and it beautifully recapitulates all the Mossbauer spectroscopy. And let me just tell you, Karsten never believed that his Mossbauer spectroscopy was wrong anyway, and I never believed it either. But um, here's the radical SAM cluster, shown right here. This is from Martin's structure. Karsten had told us that something in this intermediate species was still bound to one of the irons. We thought it would be s methionine. What it is is actually methionine after the cleavage of SAM took place, okay? What you see here is that the sulfur five prime carbon has now undergone cleavage. This has been turned into a radical, okay? And then that radical has already abstracted a hydrogen atom. This is where the six pro R hydrogen would be pointing. And it has already abstracted that hydrogen atom. Interestingly, the radical that's generated at this particular carbon has done a back attack on the auxiliary iron sulfur cluster and has created this carbon sulfur bond right here. So remember, this guy is connected to the H protein and the cluster here is connected to lipoyl synthase. So that's why these proteins get cross-linked uh, at this particular step. Interestingly, this picture beautifully explains the stereochemistry. So you abstract from one face, but the radical does a back attack on the sulfur source, which is the iron sulfur cluster. And so that's how you get inversion of configuration at carbon six. Now, the interesting thing is that Martin is like, you know, Dr. Booker, I got to try harder. One of our irons is missing in our cluster. I'm going to keep going. Maybe I had a little oxygen. I'm going to try to keep going so we can have a full four iron sulfur cluster. We said, no, Martin, don't do anything else, man. The Mossbauer told us it's supposed to just be three irons, you know. So don't keep going. <laughs> Please don't keep going. And nature made it like that. So there's a reason why nature gave that last iron a weak ligand, because it needed that iron to leave the active site. The reason why is in the next step, all of this crap here in the middle has to leave the active site. That leaves, that leaves, and then another molecule of acid methionine binds. In this case, once you generate the radical, the radical here has to abstract a hydrogen atom from carbon eight. And then that carbon, oh, that carbon has to either attack that sulfur or that sulfur. We still don't know which one happens but it can't access those sulfurs if the iron is there. And so nature actually made a channel for the iron to fall out of the active site so you can do this second step in the reaction. All right, so all of this part was the efforts of some of my early people who worked in the lab, and then you know a great graduate student, Nicholas Lons, uh, and he's all part of death and destruction. All right. He's working for the FDA now, so I think that's kind of bad that death and destruction is working for the FDA, but that's government, I guess. Um, the next part is rebirth, and this is the part that's done by um, Aaron McCarthy uh, in my lab, a, a newer graduate student. So we asked ourselves, and many others in the field you know, totally didn't like this idea at all. They didn't like the idea that you would degrade an iron sulfur cluster and have a protein that would just do one turnover, all right? In fact, we go to the Enzymes Gordon Conference and they make fun of us. You know, you're not really studying enzymology. You don't have but one turnover at the most, you know? Um, and so we figured that there must be some sort of system that can put this cluster back in every time you do a turnover. And so 
We read a lot of Tracy Roltz's papers. She's one of the key players, if not the key paper player, in our sulfur cluster biosynthesis. And I think Wing had told me about some, some uh, work from uh, Brian Robinson's lab that this protein in humans, NFU1, was really important in uh, assembling clusters in um, two oxoacid dehydrogenase enzymes. These are enzymes that have lipoic acid. And they showed that mutations in iron sulfur cluster scaffold genes, NFU1 and BOLA3, cause a fatal deficiency of multiple respiratory chain and two oxoacid dehydrogenase enzymes. And this was also capitulated in another study shown down here, uh, where they found a fatal mitochondrial disease is associated with defective NFU1 function in the maturation of a subset of mitochondrial iron sulfur proteins. And so we asked ourselves, well, the counterpart of NFU1 in E. coli is this protein called NFUA. Is it possible that NFUA uh, actually functions somehow in restoration of the cluster in lipoyl synthase? And so here's Erin McCarthy. And so what she did was isolated NFUA and showed, as did others before her, that it contains a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. And she has a beautiful spectrum that is indicative of the 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. And of course, we have Karsten next door. We can vet everything we do by Mossbauer spectroscopy. Importantly, if she mixed NFUA and LIPA together, they elude it as a complex. And this is shown in red. And then she could take all of these fractions and show that fraction A had both fr fractions associated with it. And uh, this is your NFUA control right here, shown right here. So it's clear that these proteins migrate together. Now, the experiment that she did that just really made my, I would say, year, possibly made my lifetime, I don't know. <laughs> but the experiment that she did was to run an assay. And again, here's the concentration of protein that we have in the assay. All right. In red, we're looking at formation of our six thiooctanoal intermediate and decay, shown right there. And in black, you're looking at formation of your lipoyl product. And you see that your lipoyl product is leveling off just below the concentration of enzyme. And so at this point, Wing injects iron sulfur containing NFUA, and you see activity takes off again. So that's telling us that NFUA possibly can donate an iron sulfur cluster to LIPE after turnover. And so these are some experiments where she's included NFUA in, um, in the reaction from the start. So this in black is a reaction just will, with LIPE by itself, 50 micromolar enzyme. Here she has you know, a few equivalents more of NFUA and we make more product when NFUA is present. And then I asked Wing, well, let's, let's try to convert, now I asked Aaron, let's try to convert this into sort of an enzymatic catalytic system. Why don't you decrease the concentration of LIPE and raise the concentration of NFUA? And so here's a reaction where we've decreased LIPE concentrations. This is the reaction without NFUA present. And then when FUA, is, when NFUA is there, you see that this is almost catalytic. I mean, it is catalytic. I mean, you're making multiple, multiple turnovers in this particular case, all right? And it turns out that the rate, the initial rate, if we just plot the first few data points uh, right here, the initial rate has a lower limit of about 0.25 per minute. And for a radical SAM enzyme, that's pretty respectable, let me tell you that, okay? Now the question that we wanted to ask ourselves is, based on our hypothesis that we got from Mossbauer, we should be able to do one turnover of LIPE, and then if NIF NFUA is present, we can do multiple turnovers. So if we label NFUA with S34 label sulfide, what we should see is one equivalent of lipoyl product at natural abundance, followed by multiple equivalents of lipoyl product that's S34 label. And so that's the experiment that she did. She takes S34 label NFUA, she mixes it with LIPE at natural abundance. In black, I'm showing you the product that contains S32 labeled sulfur. In red, I'm showing you the product that has S34 labeled sulfur. 
And in blue, you see a slow trickle in of product that has mixed S32, S34. But the important thing is that, again, the dashed line corresponds to the concentration of enzyme that we have present. So what's going on is when NFUA is present, you don't eat, just do one turnover on LIPE with its iron sulfur cluster, you're able to use all four sulfurs in that one iron sulfur cluster. So what's taking place is, here's our concentration of enzyme, here's our concentration of product that has two S32 labeled sulfurs, and we're making twofold more S32 labeled product than our model would predict. And then you start making product that has uh, two S34s associated with it. This mixed species that we see comes from um, spurious breakdown of the cluster and reconstitution in, in the presence of our reductant dithionite, okay? So, um, and so basically what I wanna leave you with is that this protein most likely in the presence of NFUA, all right, uses all four of the sulfurs in that, in that secondary iron sulfur cluster. So what happens is that it uses two sulfurs at the very beginning, and somehow NFUA allows the second two iron two sulfur cluster that's left behind to migrate into the catalytic site where it can be used up. And then NFUA then donates its cluster to the protein and then you start recycling. And so we're really excited about that. We can reconstitute NFUA with selenium, in fact. And what you see is two equivalents of S32 labeled lipoic acid followed by selenium lipoic acid, right? And so we're excited about that because you can trace selenium by X-ray crystallography. So we can see where the seleniums lie in the cluster at these intermediate states of catalysis. And so we're really excited about that. And so lastly, let me just quickly leave you with the, uh, some conclusions. Uh, so what I've told you today is that lipoyl synthase, unlike most radical SAM enzymes, has two 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. One of the clusters is the radical SAM cluster that lets you generate your potent oxidant to cleave the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Uh, the second cluster with the weak serine ligand is the source of the inserted sulfur atoms. It gets degraded. The protein loses activity. That's where death and destruction comes from. We know that you put sulfur in at C6 first, and when you do that, you get a cross-linked species, uh, wherein the protein now has a three iron four sulfur cluster with an organic group attached to it. The subsequent step leads to complete cluster destruction under single turnover conditions. So these are conditions under which NFUA is not present. We only get one turnover. We know that the cluster can be reinstalled via NFUA, and in the presence of NFUA, all four sulfide ions in the auxiliary cluster appear to be activated to transfer to substrate, and that's been very exciting to us. Uh, and we also did some competition experiments to show that cluster transfer from NFUA to LIPE is direct. I didn't share those with you just because of time. And then lastly, these are the wonderful people who've done the work. Um, Nick, again, is death and destruction. Aaron is rebirth. Maria and Karsten. Uh, Maria is a scientist at Brandeis. She's a professor there. Awesome. Uh, Mossbauer spectroscopist trained by Karsten. She did a lot of the Mossbauer for us. Martin and Kathy Drennan uh, worked with us on structure. Martin was mentored by Peter Goldman, a, a graduate student who was in Kathy's lab at the time. These are some other people, mainly undergraduates and technicians in my lab who uh, worked on the project. And lastly, let me just, you know, I have to thank funding because, you know, we started this project back I don't know, when I first got to Penn State, you know. And back then, nobody who was studying radical SAM enzymes had any activity, you know, just no turnover at all. And, um, you know, I submitted my first NIH grant, and Warren Jones was my program officer. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard for an enzymologist to make an act, a living without activity, let me tell you that, you know. And so, you know, the grant came back, and it wasn't, it wasn't, 
but didn't have a fundable score, let me just say that, but it was on the line, you know. And, um, you know, Warren took a chance on us uh, at that time, you know. And, um, and it's because of that that we were able to get the money that we needed to, to sort of do this work. And I think we made really important um, uh, contributions to our understanding of how you functionalize unactivated uh, you know, carbon centers. And so, uh, you know, NIH has been very good to me and I'm, I'm you know, if, if I didn't get that grant, I wouldn't be here today, let me tell you that. Uh, so, uh, so I wanna thank NIH. Uh, we're getting partial support to do some of the stuff with, from the National Science Foundation now. HHMI pays my salary now and I'm happy for, for that. And I wanna thank you for, for your attention. It's been a great visit. About the C ring that is supposed to make that iron label. Right. If you can, if you can, you actually mutate that to a cysteine. Yeah, we've way. done those. We haven't published it. So when you make a cysteine there, all hell breaks loose. All right. So what happens is you actually attach the chain to the sulfur. All right. So carbon six becomes attached to the sulfur of the iron sulfur cluster. All right. But Carbon-8 can't swing around to attack the other sulfur, right? So in the process, you're, you're still generating radicals. What happens is, is that you generate what looks like a cyclopropane ring, all right? So you're still doing chemistry. You generate a cyclopropane ring that is, is, is resolved from the iron sulfur cluster. Um, in the process, we get some really weird iron sulfur cluster signals in the EPR, uh, S is equal to nine half uh, cluster. Uh, so there's some weird chemistry going on when we change a cysteine. So it's clear that you need a ligand that, that can leave uh, in order for the reaction to take place. One more question. So uh, in, your, in the media, you also have the methionine binding to the other iron sulfur cluster. Right. So you said that it all have to leave. So when that leaves, does that it does, does that affect the other ions of our cluster then? Well, I would imagine not. So in the next step, you know, it just turns out that we trapped it while everything is there. So we don't have a structure where 5 prime deoxyadenosine has left and methionine has left. It might not even crystallize. I don't know. Um, but in order to do the next step, we know a second equivalent of SAM has to come in. And that would necessitate that methionine and 5 prime deoxyadenosine would have to leave, and you know we've done the stoichiometry on that, so it's it's based on that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for a very nice talk. Thank you. I have a question about the second part of the talk. Rebirth. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so, do you think that NFU is uh, contributing a four iron four sulfur cluster, and what's the fate of the remaining two iron two sulfur cluster for the auxiliary cluster, right? Right. Because you are left with a two iron, two sulfur cluster. Right. Well, right. So in the presence of NFUA, what we think is happening is that the remaining two iron, two sulfur cluster moves in closer to where, you know, the substrate and the five prime deoxyadenosyl radical are. That's our hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that only happens when NFUA is there. So that two, second two iron, two sulfur cluster gets used up. Okay. So that's why when NFUA is present, we get two equivalents of, of, of lipoic acid. So mm -hmm. you have four sulfurs in an iron sulfur cluster, two get used up for the first turnover, two get used up for the second turnover, and the third turnover and beyond, mm -hmm. the sulfurs ultimately come from NFUA. All right, so what we don't know right now, we're actively investigating, is whether NFUA somehow contributes just a partial iron exactly. sulfur cluster? That was, a that was your question. Part of my like question. a two iron, two sulfur yes. cluster, yes, exactly. or whether, you know, it's it waits for the other stuff to move right. over and it gives a full four. We're trying to address that right now by Mossbauer. So we're looking at this whole process by, by Mossbauer. We think NFUA may have more than one function um, mm -hmm. um, in this reaction. So, yeah, that's, yeah. We, we don't know. Hi. Um, do you need any other kinds of thiol ligands to get these 
either four iron, four sulfur, or two iron, two sulfur clusters to transfer? Like, is there glutathione in there? That's a good question. So um, what I can tell you, tell you is we will purposely go back and answer that question in our studies. But what I can tell you is that all of our reactions have at least a small amount of DTT, at least 100 micromolar, if not one millimolar. Mm -hmm. So we almost always have thiols present. Now, I'm pretty sure a long time ago, we've run these reactions without thiols, but this wasn't when we, had, when we were doing the NFUA stuff, right? This is just single turnover type reactions, and we can get single turnover to take place without thiols. Mm -hmm. But for this two iron, two sulfur to move into the, or, or whatever, um, we haven't done that explicitly. Uh, wherein we've omitted thiols, and I think it's a good enough question that I'll tell them that we need to do that to make sure, because we, the bottom line is we really don't understand that process yet, and we're hoping, you know, we're hoping to use mass spectrometry to address it, because um, you can look at all these clusters by, by ESI, MI, uh, MS, uh, and then crystallography, so we're hoping we'll be able to shed some light. We're interested in the chemistry, and so we're interested exactly in how the clusters get trafficked from one protein, so bond breaking and bond making type questions. So one more question. So if you were to, to take a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster on NFU and, and separate it into two, two iron, two, do you need an electron acceptor to do that? Or, I mean, do you Right, know? right. So we haven't been able to do that. Let me just say, first of all, we haven't been able to do that experiment. Okay. Uh, so it depends on the oxidation states of, so if you have a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster, then you're gonna have two irons, iron twos and two iron threes. So if you have a two iron, two sulfur cluster, they're most stable in their diferic state, then you're gonna need two electrons you know, in that process. Um, if you had two you know, mixed valent two iron, two sulfur clusters, a ferric and a ferrous, then you could combine them together and make a full four iron, four sulfur cluster without adding an electron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanking Square for an extraordinary talk. I want to remind everyone that uh, there is a coffee reception hosted by FAES in the library afterwards, so please join.